Hey, Kathleen, welcome to the show. As a way of getting started, give us a little background on yourself. Brian, thank you. Glad to be here. So Kathleen Osgood, I am based in Denver these days after a few years in Silicon Valley, which was fun, except for the traffic. Um, and I work in the B2B SaaS space. How'd you get into sales? <laughs> uh, the wrong an road. <laughs> It's funny, you know, if you'd, if you'd met me when I was a child, I was fairly introverted and quite quiet. Um, and then I guess blossomed after college, but in the summer, uh, I always started these little side hustles where I had to sell what I was creating. And I think that was sort of the catalyst. Uh, and here I am today, but 16 years later, which is wild to think about. And did you like it at first? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, just you know, I, yeah, it's hard when you're when you're a, a new sales rep and you don't really know what you're doing. Um, you know, there's a lot of coaching and feedback that you need to be good about accepting. I've heard that thread in a lot of your of your shows, but uh, you know, you, you kind of you got to get tough and you learn and you get better, and and then it gets really fun. Yeah. Now I love it. And why did you decide to go into leadership? Well, I've, I've played both sides. Um, in my last role at BASE, which Zendesk acquired, um, I started as an individual contributor and um, kind of built the playbook for how evaluation should run and that would be successful. Um, and it was fun, right? And I was able to document some of those learnings and I brought it to my CEO and said, hey, if, we, if the rest of the team does this, I think we can improve our win rates. And he said, hey, you've got a job. <laughs> so was leading the SMB and mid-market teams for BASE um, and then actually wanted to continue to grow my enterprise practice. Like I wanted to be an enterprise seller. So I actually went back to be becoming an individual contributor, which I think was a really great step for me because selling to fortune 500 is really different than selling to, you know, a sub 1000 SMB, a company. So good learnings for me. Yeah. The demo is still important, but it's not like it is an SMB. I'll tell you, I, I think I demo less than I ever used to. I might share a, a slide at this point, and it's really more about what are we trying to do here? It's a lot of, a lot of relationships, a lot of chatting. And, and you're also setting. selling to the hardest persona out there, aren't you? Um, so today I'm with a company called Clary. I've been there for about three years and we sit in what's called the revenue operations space. Okay. And I lovingly say that that's one of those Silicon Valley like terms that's just a marketing speak because ultimately I sell to CROs, but I also have a heavy IT influence, which has been really interesting for me because they're incredibly different buyers and you have to approach them in different ways. But which is easier. I love chief revenue officers. Yeah. I love sales leaders because it's sales to sales, right? They yeah. understand and and the outcomes, the business outcomes that we're delivering on often are, you know, net positive for the revenue leaders. So they're always excited about our technology. Um, but the sales leaders don't have much budget, right? That they don't like, they don't get up in the morning and they go, what, what tool can I buy? <laughs> You're totally right. However, a good sales leader can make budget. They know the people that can help you get budget. Um, so, you know, anybody who's been through sort of classic sales training, if you think about champion building, if you can have a revenue leader as your champion in the organization, you know, if they have a relationship with the C CFO or VP of finance and they can move things around. That's true because IT just kind of lays the facts down. I love IT too. I mean, I, I, again, that was a growth curve for me in the last few years where the way that IT approaches an evaluation of technology is incredibly different, right? So, you know, they're really concerned about risk. They're really concerned about resources. So the pitch is really different. The evaluation path is very different. So I'm often running two parallel tracks in, in my projects. And why, I mean, it must've been a big, change now leading other enterprise reps or has it been because they're rascals they're like <laughs> <laughs> yes and no um i think i think a lot of times you have really good sellers that go on to become leaders and they have a hard time sort of 
teaching those intangibles, but I don't know that I was a natural seller. So when I approach coaching, I've actually been coached and I've been coached a lot. So I try to sort of put myself a few years ago, how would I have thought about this? You know, and I, I just try to keep it, you know, a dialogue. So, because, <clears throat> because enterprise reps by nature have been in the game a while. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And they can be averse to change, certainly. But I think yeah. the, the best reps, right? The best reps are coachable and they want to be successful, right? And what I've seen, and I think Clary's hiring profile has been really good, is that the, the people that are on board really care about the solution that's being delivered. And that's like the outcome for the client, right? Yeah. So we tend to be in the right deals, right? We're not pursuing the wrong deals, which means coaching and feedback, it actually gets easier. And I, but I also see that a sale like that could naturally go to no decision or not now or do nothing, whatever you call this. Yeah, the, the not now, I think, if you think of sort of order of priorities, right? Um, especially from a business systems perspective, there are big projects happening all the time. Where do we fit, right? right? So even if they have budget, do they have the people resources to support an implementation? And some of our deal cycles can be very long due to that. Right. Um, so, but again, that's where the relationship piece comes in and you're just sort of the consultant where you, you stay next to them, you know, you keep aligned with what their goals are and then timing works out. And what motivated you to get into leadership? Was it because enterprise can be pretty addictive once you're successful at it. Yeah, it, it is. <laughs> it is. And I, I will say that I still am responsible um, for some specific strategic accounts. So I still get my like foot in the water, which, which I really like. Um, I think if I look at my long-term goals, I don't know that I'll be in the sales side of the house indefinitely, but I really wanted to understand how a business thinks about resourcing a team, how they think about, you know, comping a team. I'm actually more operationally inclined, like mm -hmm. 10 years from now, hopefully I'll be a CLO, but I think, you know, lead sellers, I'm spending a lot of time learning about the success and aftermarket motion. And so really think about the sort of integrated view of a business. Well, where did that interest come from? Given that I don't know. I think it's inherent. I'm a tinkerer by nature, right? What yeah. do I do with my free time on the weekends? I take apart antique furniture and rebuild it, right? Or oh, me too. <laughs> yeah. So I like to tinker. And I think when I like, I like touching things and learning about things. And it's just, it's just interesting to me. It gets me excited. So the kind of the building of something or repairing of something or? I think both, Brian. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure if you have taken things apart, you've made mistakes before and you learn from those mistakes. I tend not to take anything apart. <laughs> right, right. And, but I think too, you know, I'm, I'm surrounded by really smart people. So our CRO has a chief of staff who's like kind of a mentor to me, right? He's a peer in terms of age, but the way he thinks about the business is really interesting. So, uh, you know, every couple of weeks we get on a phone call, we chat, you know, I hear what he's thinking about, what the org is thinking about, and I just like it. I really enjoy it. And when you're hiring reps, what do you look for? So we are what we would call like a late stage startup. Um, and I, I mentioned that because I think the hiring profile is quite different than if you were talking to like an SAP leader or sort of a, a really big company. So our total selling population, I think we're 45 sellers now, individual contributors. Grit matters, right? So we have a wonderful inside sales team, right? SDR, BDR model, depending on the term you use. Um, but our really good reps they just roll up the sleeves and they get to know their accounts um and they just get into it you know this is not an organization where you would just sit and wait for inbound you you wouldn't hit your number that way and i i can't imagine that it's a that it, i i can't imagine that it's a classic enterprise sale they're not sitting around waiting to solve this problem you got to build a relationship with the people have long in depth conversations about what they want to achieve, what their challenges are now <clears throat> and open their minds up because yeah. 
a lot of CROs aren't bought into the technology. They kind of give it to ops or sales admin and, and try and stay focused on revenue, their job. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you hit the nail on the head. It, this is not a sales cycle that gets done with one person, right? We'll have 20 people involved because it, it does touch operations. You know, we need sponsorship from sellers. We need sponsorship from finance. So the best reps, they know that, right? They're not going to single thread. Um, they might have a conversation with one business unit and, and sort of take a nugget from that one conversation and say, hey, could I, could I use that nugget? in an outbound message to, you know, a revenue leader from this other and really try to get their arms around the whole rather than pick off a BU, right? That's a good foot in the door, but like yeah. you are a salesperson, you don't want a five figure deal. You don't want a six figure deal. You want a seven figure deal. And you get that by spending the time to, to get consensus from the org. Yeah. You're not going to get that by offering the end of the quarter deal. Right. <laughs> You're right. going to earn it. Right. And how do how can you tell that those skills in the interview process? Because so a lot of our re, uh, recruiting is actually referral based. The majority of our recruiting, um, and that's a mantra across uh, marketing and CS as well. So who was the best person you worked with in your last two companies? Refer them in, right? And obviously we incentivize that referral motion because we've gotten the best talent that way. And. What's the biggest adjustment? Because if they're used to selling to marketing or they're used to selling pure IT infrastructure, yeah. as opposed to IT just needing to integrate it. Yeah. So I know that the term intellectual curiosity always gets tossed around and I, it is a buzzword and I'm sort of like remiss in even using it, but to me, if you are a sales professional, and I mean professional in every sense of the word, and you really care about the clients you're serving and the job that you're doing, you're going to take the time to get to know the market, right? And it's that diligence and that attention to detail that we're looking for, and it tends to go far. I will say uh, our salespeople are very, very good. Even our more junior commercial reps, like I'd put them head to head with, with virtually any other organization. It's just, they're smart, they're dedicated, they're gritty, they're, they're wonderful. And when you say gritty, what does that mean to you? We exist in a very competitive space. Yeah. Um, and we also will sometimes compete, not necessarily for the right reasons, but with some elephants, right? Um, elephants who might be already a vendor for our prospective clients. So, you know, you, it's an uphill battle and you're going to get told no a fair bit. So it's that sort of tough skin and the willingness to just go back again and keep hitting it, not giving up. Yeah, kind of that Ivy League street fighter type thing. <laughs> right, I love yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> that's great. It's got that sort of posh uh, front facing, but yeah, they'll, they'll pull fists as needed. Um, I also think uh, presentation skills and writing skills more so now than ever, because we're remote, we used to always be client facing, right? And relationships are really easy to build when you're client facing or easier, I should say. So we've found that, you know, some, some excellent writing skills have actually gone, done really, really well for us uh, during COVID because I think people appreciate the attention to detail and just thoughtfulness overall. And where do the deals typically get stuck? You know, you got IT's buy-in, CRO sees yeah. the value. I would say, and this is sim oversimplifying, there are sort of two buying tracks with, with Clary. There are some larger organizations who will say, I have a problem with forecasting that I want to solve, right? And we know it's an operational expense. We're not accurate. My CRO is going to get ousted because he missed his call so badly last quarter. So we're going to fund a project for forecasting. Those tend to move quite smoothly because it's just sort of technical discovery, needs assessment, right? And getting through InfoSec and procurement, those actually tend to roll along. But to your earlier comment, that's not always the case. That probably only accounts for about 15 to 20% of our pursuits. Most of them is we're, we're coming into a company where they don't really know that they have a problem yet, right? And we're Wait helping them. 
Right. So we're helping them understand that, hey, those 14 people that you're paying salaries for to do this one sort of Excel sheet, like, does that actually make sense? But we, we have to take it a little more slowly than that. So again, it's, it's timing, right? And budget that those tend to be, hey, what you're doing is really, really interesting, but this is the exercise we need to go through in order to fund something along these lines. And how much, how do you take the people who have done other things? We mentioned curiosity, but this is strategy because you're going to run into people going to feel displaced or possibly displaced or reallocated on the customer side. You got to have many conversations, not presentation, demo, POC, proposal, close, yeah. because that'll never work. It always gets stuck. So something that I think the team does a good job of is, is really sort of positioning ourselves. Like, are we in our potential buyer's shoes, right? When you deliver the Clary solution, you're going to win awards. And then this is not, I'm not saying this, like we actually have a stakeholder from McAfee who won this sort of CEO golden ticket award for what they did with the Clary project. And so it's sort of aligning with like, Hey, this is what you can expect by partnering with us. Like we're here for you. Um, but that you can't do that in one meeting to your point, they have to trust that. And we try to do a lot of reference work where we'll build, uh, bring existing clients to meetings. We've also done some meetings where it's not, I wouldn't even call it a reference. It's like, we, we step back and we say, here's five clients. You can come and sit with them and chat and just pick their brains, you know, open, honest communication. We don't want to overpromise, especially anytime you're solutioning in the software space. So that that's tends to go really, really well for us. So I think the, the really, the great reps, they're just guides. So they know they're like conductors, right? So I know the old analogy of like quarterback in a football, but I, I'm not a sports person. I'm so sorry for all of your listeners who are. Um, but you think about, you go to a symphony and you watch the conductor and they know when to call on the specific people in the orchestra and what do they need to hear now? And who do you need to bring up now, right? And that's what's happening with our best reps. They know when to bring in a solutions engineer. They know when to bring in an architect. They know when to bring in a reference. And that's a skill in and of itself, isn't it? I think it is. And I think coaching, right, and team meetings and something that we do at Clary is when um, more strategic pursuits come in, there's, you know, a sales meeting where you can come in and listen to the rep actually debrief how to, what happened in this deal. They literally will just talk you through six months or nine months of a deal. And what do you see the top reps do that top 1% versus the, the, the Listen, not, there not are the just players. some intangibles. Yeah, I, I just think there are some people who do these incredible above and beyond. So I'm gonna talk about a renewal with expansion that happened recently. I can't name the company. It would be a company that you know. Um, about six months before the renewal was coming due, the rep started doing direct outreach. They sort of worked with customer success to say, who are our top users in this account, VP or above? Then ghost wrote notes for executives at Clary to send to those VPs. How are you doing? How are you liking it? Why don't we get on a meeting? Then that rep sat on all of those executive overview meetings, got feedback, got suggestions on how to improve the product, built direct quotes from those leaders into a pitch deck which they then presented to procurement when it came time to renew and grow. It was beautiful. I mean, it was beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, right? Are you like, wow, that was pretty slick. That is great. You know, yeah. I did I did it for QBR once where I videotaped my clients talking about the product. I like that. And then I rented a big TV and we showed it to the board and the founder just took me aside and said, you're playing at a whole nother level. <laughs> and that's the thing. And I think like, I think we need to talk about more examples like that because people can learn like your idea. I'm like, I'm going to snipe that. And I'm going to share that with the team and be like, I love that. Let's oh, get no. <laughs> <laughs> but I think a lot of times, like with coaching and feedback like this, we talk about, again, the key terms that you always hear about hustle, grit, hard work, but then you really want to see practical examples and like, I think that's what needs to happen in more of these podcasts and coaching sessions. Right. You just 
if I was them, what would I want to hear? Right. Yeah. They don't Show want me to hear it from a rep. Yeah. They want to hear yeah. it from the user, the person who's getting value out of it in a tangible way, not a canned way. Exactly. And you know what's really interesting? And granted, we have a great marketing team, but the way that we talk about our product is a little bit different than how our customers actually talk about it afterwards. And that was a big effort for us in the last year was to say, hey, we think we deliver this value, but you tell us what you think. Yes. And then we're going to use those sound bites. And that's been really, really productive. Yeah. And it doesn't have too many people that get buzzword compliant. And I don't know what that means. Oh, my God. So again, Bay Area company, you're still in the Bay Area, aren't you? Yeah. It's like buzzword city. Everybody's always trying to coin the new term. Right. I fell into Tola. Like, they're like, what are you talking about? Right. And so we just have to boil it down to like, this is what we're actually going to do for you. Buzzwords aside, we're not right. going to use this. Get away from big data, AI enabled. <laughs> right. Everybody's favorite. Everybody's favorite. And have you noticed what prevents somebody from making that transition to enterprise? Is it mindset that they're not looking at the bigger picture? They, they're not playing the whole game? Um, that's a really interesting question because I, I thought about this a lot a few years ago. In fact, when I said I want to be an enterprise seller, there is a certain amount of maturity and intelligence that it takes. If I'd been put into my enterprise role when I was 26, I would not have been successful. I just wouldn't have been. I was, I was one of those hot go-getters, fast, fast, fast. And that's just not the reality of market. It isn't. You have to be patient and you need to be okay with these mini no's that are going to come out pretty consistently. So it, it's a tough question. I do feel like for all of those uh, Queen's Gambit watchers right now, it is a game of chess, right? And if you're patient enough to really think about the, the board and all of your pieces, you can be very successful. Um, we have a rep who does these pretty incredible account plans. It's just in like GDocs, right? It's not fancy, but where they document every meeting and they take notes and they're dropping in LinkedIn profiles. So they know we met with all of these people, this name was mentioned and they're just keeping track of things in a way that I think lesser reps may, may not be. And I love the chest analogy because you, you got to be in the game and, and there's no one magic move. No, <laughs> there are a lot of moves and they might be played at different times, right? right? Depending on, on the pursuit that you're in, for sure. <clears throat> and that ability to, you know, empathy is one thing, but to put yourself in the other person's place, what would get the meeting, what would engage them, what would make them take action? Yeah. And again, because our buying persona is so diverse, it just takes a, a mature mind to really think about what an op stakeholder cares about and their outcomes are wildly different than a revenue leaders. They're just yep. different. And you need to make sure you're mapping your, your dialogue and your discussion appropriately. And, and when you're in a QBR or on a forecast review, how can you tell where a deal really is? Well, we have Clary, so we always know where our deals are. <laughs> I mean, that's our bread and butter, right? <laughs> Not so subtle plug there, of course. Um, <laughs> you wouldn't be a rep if you didn't do that. Right, right, exactly. Uh, so listen, different organizations have different sort of levels of maturity with how they think about forecasting in particular. Forecasting is something that I pay very close attention to. It's where a lot of our projects sit. So I, I know this space very well. There does need to be some level of process that everybody subscribes to in the organization. Like I see this a lot in bigger organizations where you acquire a company or you have a, like EMEA is doing something wildly different than America's. Somebody needs to believe that in order to call a number, there needs to be agreement across the organization in terms of what equals commit. Let's get some rules aligned and commit, right? So for Clary, if a deal is committed, it's coming in, right? And the timeline might be, is it this quarter? Is it next? Right. And hopefully we know, you know, with some clarity, um, but commit means a very specific things for, thing for us. It's funded. Right. And we know who's going to sign. Right. Cause we can work through the rest. But, but you must ask questions, right? Oh, because, course. you know, I, I was on a call with somebody else who had a seven, eight figure deal then found out that one of the competitors founders was on the board. 
stalled well, the deal. I would argue that they should have known that well before. That's what they I told them. <laughs> yeah. That to me is table stakes. That's like stage one in Salesforce. Like <laughs> you've done that through work. <laughs> well, it, I guess, right. Because you, you get comfortable with the people you talk to. <clears throat> yeah. We're, we're in a world where, does the board need to approve it? Uh, they can veto it, but they, do they need to, maybe, maybe they don't, but they have an opinion. Yeah. And there's, and there's no CEO that's not going to run it by them. Yeah. And listen, board influence is real. We've won some projects based on board influence, right? So we're, we're Bain and Sequoia. Uh, we're sort of our early funding. Great network, smart people. You better believe they referred us into our, some of our sister companies, right? Yeah. And those are board level connections saying, hey, this is good tech, give it a look. So great, great point. But yeah, that should have come out far sooner in the deal cycle. Cool. Hey, this has been a great conversation. Uh, where can people go to connect and follow you? I am on LinkedIn. I am not, unfortunately, a Twitter user because I'm too busy <laughs> in deal cycles, but love to connect on LinkedIn, or you can reach me at Kathleen at Clary.com.